morning. I would like to talk about a word. A word that applies to this church and to each one of you individually. God can make our life great, wonderful, outstanding, marvelous, all of those adjectives. Or we can be of all men most miserable. It all depends on our attitude toward God. And this morning I want to talk about the good side. What God will do with us. And use the word exceeding. Exceeding is a fantastic word. I love it. Paul used it several times. The Bible talks about it a few times in the Old Testament. I want to read just to illustrate and help you understand the usage of this word and the impact on our life and on our world, on our society, on this church. Turn with me to some verses here just quickly. We'll start with Genesis chapter 7. And again, these are just examples from the Bible of what God's usage of this word. Genesis chapter 7, verse 19. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth. Now you know exceedingly, you know the Bible is telling us about the flood. You know about floods. Remember Andoy? That's exceeding water. <laughs> Another one, Genesis chapter 17, only a few chapters over, and verse 6, Genesis 17, and verse 6, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful. Now there's a blessing to be told as his child. I will make you exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee. That should be our desire. From the beginning of this church, when Pastor began the work there, his desire is that this will be exceedingly fruitful ministry. Genesis or Mark chapter 14, go all the way back to the New Testament. Mark chapter 14 and verse 43. Mark 14, verse 43, And immediately, while he yet spake, come unto us, one of the twelve, and with him a great multitude, and with swords and staves from the chief priests, the scribes and the elders. Now that great multitude is in reference to the idea of exceeding. One more verse, or two more, let's just quickly look. Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. Now, unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Now there is the application to us. Exceeding abundantly above all that we could imagine, all that we could think. You know, the promise of God is that He will do for us exceeding abundantly. Now, when I think of that, I see that as being more than I can imagine. Can you imagine something wonderful? Can you imagine something great for this church? Can you imagine something God will do with your life? Now, think beyond that. And God is able to do exceeding beyond what you think. More even than you can do together. Without the Holy Spirit, you are a group, a crowd, a congregation. With the Holy Spirit, you are a force. A force for God. You are, you are empowered is what the Bible tells us. Now I want to talk about how that applies to what we are doing for the Lord. How does it apply to us? How does it apply in what I am for God? So I want to bring to your mind that you 
are involved in what God wants to accomplish in this world. Think about that. As a church, as a soul winner, as a witness, you are involved. You are part of it. Part of what God wants to do in this world. You see, God does have a purpose. God always has a purpose. The wonderful promise that Christ made in the book of John and the actual event that promise was to the apostles and the actual event of the coming of the Holy Spirit and the beginning of that promise in the book of Acts, Christ sent to this world the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit did what Christ did. You see, Christ had an agenda. Nothing was by accident. You know, if, if you watch the television or you read the news or you read some books, they will say that Christ did not really know what was going to happen to him. But we know, according to the Word of God, he knew very well what was going to happen that he would be crucified, and that was his agenda. That was his purpose. That was why he came. Now, behind Christ, when he left, Jesus told the apostles in the book of John, it is necessary that this one come when I go away. The Holy Spirit also came with an agenda. His agenda was to empower you to make you a blessing, to make you able to do something exceeding and abundantly more than you ever thought. We are to be filled with the Holy Spirit, is my point. You see, the extraordinary power that we are talking about fell on the church at the book of Acts. It came to the church, to the Christians at Pentecost. In the book of Acts chapter 2 verse 4, the Bible says they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now that power, that unusual power, came upon the church and its messengers. That's you. That's me. The messengers. You know, the church is not this building. You know that. You have heard that before from your pastor. You are the church. Individually, you are the member. Individually, you are the messenger that God is empowering. And He wants you again and again to be using that power for the purpose of God. Now I want to just go through a few verses here and help you see real clear this feeling. Acts chapter 4 is where we will begin. Acts chapter 4 and verse 8. Acts chapter 4, verse 8, the Bible says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel. They saw, as Peter preached, as he stood before the elders of Israel, as he stood before these religious people, these Pharisees, if you will, he preached to them, he spoke to them, and they saw the boldness in verse 13. Look there. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned, they were ignorant, this man had not been to seminary, this man had not been to Bible school, they had not sat before the rabbi for any reason, this were fishermen, lawyers, doctors, this were people who did not know, and yet they spoke with power. Verse 31, same chapter. Verse 31, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken. Wouldn't it be amazing to have a prayer meeting here and the place is shaken with the power of God? Amen. That's exceeding, folks. That's the power of God working. They were filled with the Spirit and they spoke of God with boldness. In chapter 6, Verse 5, 
chapter 6, verse 5, the Bible says, And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. I want you to see the Jews could not withstand the wisdom as we go down to verse 10. And they were not able to resist the wisdom of the, and the spirit by which they spake. When you hold a Bible study in somebody's home, when you are teaching them the Word of God, it should be the power of God is that they cannot withstand, that they must yield. They will accept Christ. In the book of, or chapter 7, sorry, still in Acts chapter 7 and verse 55. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly unto heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Oh, that's amazing. That would be amazing. To see as Elijah, as Stephen, to see Christ, I had lifted up in his throne beside God. How does that happen? I believe it happens as we draw closer to God. The Holy Spirit can enlighten us. In chapter 11, verse 24, we see about Barnabas. <clears throat> For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Now that should be our testimony. If somebody could put that on your tombstone. That is your epitaph. That is what they put under your name. A man filled with the Holy Ghost, and many were added unto the Lord. Wow. What a testimony. Fantastic thing to say about somebody. Chapter 13 and verse 9. Chapter 13, then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, he looked at a man named Elimas and called him the child of the devil. Now understand this. The Holy Spirit came to this earth with a passion. I have said to our pastors as we teach in the Bible school, you cannot have a successful ministry for God without a passion. There must be a burning desire as says in the scripture, there's a fire burning within me. You cannot escape it. You cannot go anywhere away from it. You cannot hide from it. It's always there and I suggest that you as God's child should always have a passion to share Christ with your relatives, your friends, those you influence. The Holy Spirit came with that passion to accomplish the work that he was commissioned to accomplish. I said to you before, God has a purpose in all he does. God has a reason for everything. I want you to understand two things about this passion I think are important. First of all, the Holy Spirit came and has a white hot passion to empower us, to give us the power to the ends of the earth to be a witness unto Christ. That's why you have church here. That is why you are supporting missionaries as they go to other parts of the world. You have a passion to spread the gospel to all parts of the world. The reason the Holy Spirit has that passion is because that is God's all-inclusive purpose. From the beginning until now. Everything that happened from Genesis until today is to fulfill the purpose of God. God has a timeline, if you will. God has an agenda. God has been fulfilling that from Adam and Eve until today. It is still going on. <clears throat> now let me tell you what that purpose is. 
Did you ever wonder, is there a single purpose? How can I define it? What is it? Well, I suggest to you that God's purpose is glory to Him. Everything that we do should be to bring glory to Him. The Bible tells us in, in the, the book of Numbers, chapter 41. Go back there with me. The book of Numbers, chapter 14. Sorry. Numbers chapter 14, and look at verse 21. But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. And that is God's purpose. All the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. In the book of Joshua, the book of Joshua chapter 4 God brought his people into Canaan and he brought his people so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty our God is mighty and it is our task to inform the others of that mighty David in the book of Psalms chapter 96 and verse 1. Let's look at three verses here. Psalms chapter 96 and verse 1 is where we will begin. The 96th Psalm, verse 1. Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord, all the earth. Sing unto the Lord, bless His name, show forth His salvation from day to day. Declare His glory among the heathen, His wonders among all nations, all people. That is our task. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6, that portion of Scripture is giving God a God's word to you and I. I will give her, and we are God's word, sorry. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Jesus, in the book of Matthew, quickly turn there. Matthew chapter 13 and verse uh, lost my place here. Verse, I'm sorry, I'm ahead of myself. Matthew 28 and verse 19. I know you know this verse, but I believe it's better to read it from the Word of God than to think it only. Amen. You see, we put the Word of God in our head that we might not forget about Him. That we know Him. It reminds us day by day. But I suggest you read it from God's Word. Don't change anything by accident. Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. Go ye therefore. Why? Because God has given you power. God has made you able. Now, Mark 13 and verse 10. Mark 13 and verse 10. And the gospel must be first be published among all nations. That is our task. You see, it doesn't mean political nations. It's talking about all people. We're not talking about whether you go to Russia or Germany or to Ukraine. We're talking about do you go to your neighbor? Do you go to your barcada? Do you go to the one in the market? Do you go to the one on the jitney beside you? On the bus? Revelation chapter 5. We see... Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, we see the consummation of all of this. Revelation 5, verse 9 is where we begin. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed 
us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. So the first thing that I would have you to remember about this first point that I have made here today, this morning is that the Spirit wants the world for Christ. Not just a little pocket in the U.S. or the Philippines. You know, the U.S. is a Christian nation, the Philippines a Christian nation. Then that should spread like water on paper. That is our purpose. That the whole world will be gained for Christ. That has been the purpose of God from the beginning of creation. And it will be His purpose until the end of this age. Now the second thing that I want you to remember is that the purpose of God, the passion of the Spirit, are not yet finished. It isn't complete. There's still more to do. Now you might wonder why. Why doesn't God finish it? I mean, He said it is finished on the cross. That was finished. Salvation is finished, but the telling is not finished. The delivery of the message is still ongoing. Jesus said, It is not for you to know the times and the seasons which the Father hath put in His own power. God is the only one who knows when this age will finish. Your pastor is a smart man. I know he is because he graduated Bible school, right? Amen. He's a smart man because he married this lady. Amen. He's no dummy, you know, he's smart. <clears throat> he, they, they together have produced three, four, or three highly intelligent ladies and one highly intelligent young man. Amen. Amen. I have to admit, Malachi kind of surprises me, but no, I'm just kidding. Sharp young men. All four of these kids came from this parents. Why? Because they're smart people. But you see, intelligence is not the issue. It is the power of God that dwells within you. This congregation is a group of intelligent people. You are following God's man. You have determined to be what God wants you to be. But where is the power in your life? That is the question. The Spirit uses disciples to reach the world. Now understand, God has a purpose. It's not finished yet. So what does He do? He uses you. He uses me. He uses us. The Spirit uses disciples to reach the world. You know the Acts chapter 1 verse 8, right? Remember that verse? Let's read it. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. A very familiar verse, but like I said a while ago, I prefer to read it. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now, one of the dangers of something called Arminianism, uh, you wonder what that is? Well, it's a basic doctrinal philosophy that uh, we have choice and we believe that. God has given us the choice to accept Him. The problem is Arminianism takes it a little further and it says you can also choose to lose it when you do something bad. If you don't do exactly right, you can lose your salvation. Now, Arminianism teaches men to take the place of God in conversion. It's up to us. Kind of like some religions you know. The better you do, the more sure you are going to heaven. You do bad, you will not go to heaven. Now that's Arminianism. On the other hand, there's something called 
Calvinism, and Calvinism places man in evangelism. I mean, it removes man from evangelism. God has already decided who will be saved, and it doesn't make any difference what you do. Never mind, you are not important. Now, the book of Acts teaches that the Holy Ghost has a purpose to reach the end of the earth through us. We are not in the place of God, but we are not removed. We are part of the equation. It is all pieces that go together to accomplish this purpose. You have a purpose. You can reach people that foster God. Did you know that? If you want to see how the Holy Spirit uses people, go in and read the book of Acts. That old book. All the way from Acts chapter 2, all the way, it's over and over and over. It shows the actions of God's people building a church and establishing a new environment called Christianity. And the third thing I want you to see today, first of all, I said I want you to see God's purpose is to reach the world for His glory. Number two, God is going to use you as disciples to accomplish that. Number three, the Spirit is going to give you power. Amen. Understand that. The Holy Spirit came with a purpose, with a passion, and He's going to give that passion to you. problem is we refuse it. Sometimes we ignore it. We are not concerned. Have you heard the word apathy? I don't care. People are, we, there's a word indispensable. People are indispensable in world missions. There is no other methodology. There is no other plan. Not radio, not tracks, not uh, the birds, not the wind, you. You are indispensable. It cannot be done without you. God's mission cannot be accomplished without us. Now we need the power of God. Yes. Jesus said, you shall receive the power when the Holy Spirit is come upon you. God has done His part. The Holy Spirit has come and done His part. But without the Holy Spirit, we are fruitless. You know, there are some churches, and I'll tell you quite frankly, there are some churches I wonder, where is God? Honestly. What I see is mechanism, I see mechanics, I see people coming together and singing music and having a great time, but I wonder where is God? You can't have church without God. Amen. And by the way, I'll say this also, I have learned, I have observed that I believe there are two kinds of gods in Christianity. This is just my personal observation. I believe there are churches that have a God of tolerance. Never mind what you are, God still loves you. Just come to church. Never mind if you are this or you are that. Never mind if you are whatever. Just come to church. God loves you. No, no, no. No, folks. That's not our God. You do not serve God on your terms. You serve God on His terms. And this is the thing we have to understand, that our God is a God of love. Our God is a God of passion. Our God is a God of compassion, I mean. But the point is, we follow His plan. He does not make a plan to suit us. And I am convinced that there are Christians who think, well, I can do what I want as long as I go to church. It's okay. I can. Does it mean we have to feel powerful before we can obey God's call? Do you have to feel power? No, that's not what it means. 
You don't have to feel mighty and feel powerful and feel like Mighty Mouse or Superman. That's not the issue. Several times in the book of Acts, the apostles were filled with the Holy Spirit just as they were given the opportunity to speak. God may empower you at the very moment. So how do we wait for the power? Well, I'm convinced that we wait until we are sure that the gospel is the power of God and salvation, not works. The problem is that people have come to a conclusion that if I do good, if I do right, our society here in the Philippines is based on that concept. Doing good. Doing, if I do more good, more possibility to go to heaven. If I do more good, that's better. But if I do bad, anyway, I can do good later. I want you to understand it is not based on me, it is not based on you, it is based on the blood of Jesus Christ. It is not based on what you do, it is based on what Christ did already. I think then, we serve God and the Holy Spirit will empower us. The Holy Spirit is turned loose in our lives when we put our confidence in the Word of God. When you take this message and you go to someone's home and you deliver the Word of God, let me tell you, the power is not just in you, it's in the message. When you do a Bible study, this book is what will convert them. Not your beautiful words, not your ability, although it's good you know how to tell somebody what verses they should see. There is a methodology that's better. And God will enlighten you and guide your thinking and take you to where you should go. And then you give the message, just like Philip did with the Ethiopian eunuch. And the Holy Spirit said, go here. He went there. He asked the man in the chariot, do you understand what you are reading? The man said, how can I except someone teach me? That's our job. Amen. The power is in the message that we deliver. Now the fourth thing, first of all, remember, God has a purpose. Secondly, God will use you to accomplish that purpose. Thirdly, He will give you power to do it. And fourthly, He wants to give you the passion of the Holy Spirit. The passion of the Spirit should be your passion. What drives me should be from the Holy Spirit. We should earnestly seek the power of the Spirit to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let us, you and I, we want that passion. We look for that passion. We ask for that passion. The church did not start at Pentecost, but folks, at Pentecost is where we started the power of God in the church. Christ was here before the Holy Spirit, but after Christ left, the Holy Spirit came. He empowered the church to accomplish these great things. And in Acts chapter 1, the Bible says that with one accord, they devoted themselves to prayer. With one mind, this church has one purpose, and that is to bring glory to God. And you do that by bringing people to Christ. Book of Psalms, chapter 67. Would you like to go back there with me? Book of Psalms, 67 Psalms. God be merciful unto us and bless us. Cause his face to shine on us. That thy way may be known upon earth. 
thy saving health among all nations. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for thou shalt judge the people righteously and govern the nations upon earth. Selah. Let the, uh, let the people praise thee, O God, let all the people praise thee, and then shall the earth yield her increase, and God, even our own God, shall bless thee. God shall bless us, and all the ends of the earth shall fear Him. Now the question is, what is the great purpose of God? that is revealed in this prayer that he be praised that all the nations praise him the answer is obvious it is plain god's purpose is to be known and praised and enjoyed and feared among all the nations of the earth His purpose is to be known. Verse 3 gives us the second part of the, his purpose is to be praised. Verse 4, the third part of that, that the nations be glad and sing for joy. The fourth, his purpose is to be feared. I wonder, do you really fear God? I think you understand that term. Fear does not mean you are afraid he will strike you with lightning. Fear means that you are concerned that you will lose the blessings and the promises when you disobey and go against his purpose. Just like Noah, when he built the ark, that ark represents Jesus Christ, and Noah feared God. He feared that if he did not obey God, he would lose his family. Do you have that kind of fear for your family? Do you have that kind of fear for your friends and relatives, for those around you, that if you do not bring them into the ark of Jesus Christ, they're gone. They're lost. That's the fear God is talking about. The reverence the concern. Our passion is to bring Jesus Christ to this world. Our fear is that we will be too late. Our passion is to see that God is glorified and lifted above everything else. Our fear is that we will fail in that purpose in our own life. I challenge you today as you go about serving the Lord, following the pastor, energized by the Word of God, that this church will continue to grow. This building is a long way from being finished, but the church is still in progress. This building one day will be complete, Lord willing, but you are still in a progress even then. I challenge you today. Learn the, the, the purpose of God. Be motivated by the passion of the Holy Spirit and be filled with His power to accomplish that. I'm going to ask you, by your Lord, by your God, I will be able to thank you for the Lord. I will be able to Hamon na aming tatanggap ngayon na nakita mo namin ngayon. Nainga ako na meron kayong purpose. Dito sa mundo nito. Kaya nga ako ay buti na mga tao na sa pagiging ko na. At ikaw ay walang gagamitin ko hindi kami ang tatanggap mo. Tuwing ikaw ang kinuuman, magkukutos sa amin ang isang gawa niyo. Lagi naroon naman ang pangyarihan mo po, Panginoon, ay pagkakaroon. Sa bawat na nang mong Panginoon, tutukon sa hamon ngayon. Lord, may makita po namin 
ang kalagayan ng mga tao na sa paligid po na ang kawalan ng pag-asa nila Panginoon. At sila ay tunay na nangangailangan ng kaligtasan. Kailangan nila si Kristo. Kailangan nila ang pag-asa. Kaya dalagin po namin ang Diyos sa mga nito na may ang hamon na yan ay amin po ang gabi. Amin po suko ang aming sarili para magamit po. Nabasa po namin mga talata, Panginoon. Hindi lang po ito galing sa aming kapagsalitan, hindi po rin noon galing sa inyo po sa inyo. Kaya, Panginoon, nanalangin po ako ngayon. Nanalangin po ako sa isang aming. Na patuloy na po ang banal espiritu ng Lord ang mahusap sa aming mga mahusap. Maging sa panyaya, Panginoon, Inusin mo po ang bawat puso mo na hindi po mahal. O Panginoon ay aming hiling sa pangalan ng Yesus, abang lahat kayo po. Simple lang po, tatanggapin po natin ang hama na yan. Tayo po ay dito sa alta. Lord, ito po. Gamitin mo po ang aking buhay para po magkaroon ng kaganapan ng purpose mo po sa mundo nito. You come. Amen. Amen. We are still in progress. Tayo po ang gamitin ng Panginoon. Yaan po iyong maubaya ang iyong buhay na magamit ng Diyos. Hindi ka dito sa alta. Make yourself always available sa ating Panginoon. Please, Lord. Amen. 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 Lord. 